I'd like to introduce Kevin Smith, Chair of the Board of CFI Canada. Kevin? Thank you, Shana. Uh, thank you for inviting, or thank you for allowing me to invite myself to this, Shana. Uh, I just wanted to welcome uh, Jack McLean. He is one of my colleagues on the Ask the Experts uh, page in the Auto Citizen. Welcome, Jack. Nice to see you. I've never met any of my colleagues, so it's nice to nice to meet you this evening. Uh, Richard Thane, another. Where's Richard? There you are. Um, he was a fellow board member with me a few years ago, and he would often bring to our attention a document that listed the major stages of growth of a charitable organization. Remember that, Richard? It was a textbook version of our own experiences at the Centre for Inquiry. Having started out as essentially a grassroots organization, actually it was a probably a grassroots disorganization back then, the dreams of a few University of Toronto students just five or six years ago who valued skeptical inquiry, quickly branched out across the country. Just as Richard's Bible predicted, and it was sort of a Bible because you had a lot of faith in it, you were obsessed with, with this book. <laughs> yes. Uh, the early stages of growth of any organization might be described as being on a roller coaster. I can attest that having been involved in CFI from almost the beginning, the comparison is accurate. Richard will agree that we've had ups and downs, and close to going completely upside down a few times. Uh, this is not solely a CFI problem. Every organization goes through these growing pains. It is simply a result of human interactions. Yet in these past years, it is incredible how much we have done. We've questioned in the media, or in debates, or at rallies, like the one we had today, to protest Uganda and Nigeria's treatment of LGBTQ people that if someone makes an extraordinary claim that negatively affects those most vulnerable, we will demand of them their extraordinary evidence. And this is being done every day by passionate members and volunteers at all of our 11 branches across the country. This year, we have trans transitioned into another phase of our growth. We have welcomed a new national executive director into our family. Eric Adrians has the experience to move us forward as we continue to mature as a professional organization. He has the generosity to share that experience and work with us to solve, work with us to continue to have successes as we educate and advocate for the rights of our fellow human beings in a secular society that respects those who choose to follow religion and those who don't. Eric, welcome to our CFI family. It's going to be a really fun evening. Um, I, I came up uh, and I really have to say that good work to the Ottawa team. Thanks to Shauna and, and all the volunteers and, and the members of CFI here in Ottawa for putting this on. It's a lot of work putting on an event. Uh, a lot of little details that have to be taken care of and, and the team's been doing a great job. So thanks a lot for, for putting on the event. I think it's going to be, it's going to be a nice evening. Uh, CFI's mission, and I, and I usually do one of these things, I, I ponder backwards and see if I can memorize things, but I'm not very good at it anymore. But CFI's mission is to educate and to, to promote the application of humanistic inquiry through skepticism, secularism, and rational thought. Uh, it's a really big mission. There's a lot going on in there. And we, uh, we're supposed to put, put on symposia, lectures, published works, and operate a library. Those are things that I'm really proud about. And mission statements are all often very distant, and, and I, but I really like what that's all about. But I say to myself, what makes CFI the most important thing for me? And what makes it the most important thing for, for each of you as well? So I say to myself, why do I want to be here? And I think to myself, I really care about health and wellness and, and being able to live a really good life. That's an important thing to me. I like to see it for myself. I like to see it for the people I care about. I really care about social justice and diversity. I care that the people around me in the world, around me, all around me, 
live well and, and are able to live without uh, being uh, targeted by bigotry, tar targeted by prejudice, and tar targeted by ignorance. I also think it's important that we, we pay attention to education and ethics because I think that moves us forward a lot. And those things mean a lot to me, and that's what I like. And I think of CFI as the kind of organization that's dealing with the very fundamental aspects of these things and making a change in the world and making a positive progression in the world and dealing with the fundamental reasons why some things go wrong. Making sure that there's free speech. Making sure that there's a freedom to be the person who you are. Making sure that we're all able to have free thought without being targeted, without being subjected to violence, without being uh, harassed. I think that's a pretty big, pretty important reason to be here, and that's why it's the most important thing for me. So I want to thank everybody who's in the room for engaging in some questions, dealing with fundamental reasons for things, getting to the, the core reason. And I want to wish the debaters good luck. Have fun. I'm really looking forward to it. I've already told them I'm watching for the thing that they weren't ready for the other guy to say. So that was a great fun. <laughs> so thanks so much. Thanks for taking a few moments to hear from me. And if anybody has time to say hi later, I'd love to meet with you and say hello and share some dreams. And now on with the main event. As a few people have pointed out, it's almost certainly true that a man named Jesus lived in Palestine 2,000 years ago, since Yeshua was a fairly common name in the area at the time. However, what we are discussing tonight is the historicity of the man named Jesus as described in the New Testament and upon whom Christianity is based. Tonight we will be having a discussion rather than a formal debate, and the format will be as follows. The first speaker will be Zebra Crook, because um, he won the coin toss. And uh, Dr. Crook will speak for 20 minutes, and then Dr. Carrier will present his 20-minute opening. At this point, everybody will have an opportunity to um, submit their written questions, which we'll be collecting using baskets that will be passed. Next, each speaker will have a 10-minute rebuttal, and we'll again gather questions after that. Then each speaker will have a five-minute closing. After all that, we'll have a 30-minute question period with the questions that we've selected from the written submissions. So we won't be taking any um, any live questions. All if, if you have a question, you'll have to uh, submit it in writing, and hopefully everybody has um, a pencil and a piece of paper, um, and uh, uh, you'll be able, if, if you don't, um, raise your hand and the ushers will uh, be delighted to pass you one. Okay, um, so now I'll tell you a bit about our speakers. Zebra Crook has a PhD in New Testament studies from the University of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. And Zebra Crook is the one on the far left. He is, he is the author of Parallel Gospels, a synopsis of early Christian writing, and Reconceptualizing Conversion, Patronage, Loyalty, and Conversion in the Religions of the Ancient Mediterranean, also the editor of several books and a dozen articles on the social world of ancient Christianity. He is an associate professor of religious studies at Carleton University, where he has taught for the last 10 years. His current work is in memory theory, applying research on how groups remember, distort, and invent the past to early Christian writings about Jesus. Our other speaker, Richard Carrier, is a world-renowned author and speaker. As a professional historian, published philosopher, and prominent defender of the American free thought movement, Dr. Carrier has appeared across the US and Canada and the UK, and on American television and London radio, defending sound historical methods and the ethical worldview of secular naturalism. His books and articles have received international attention. With a PhD from Columbia University in Ancient History, he specializes in the intellectual history of Greece and Rome, particularly ancient philosophy, religion, and science, with emphasis on the origins of Christianity and the use and progress of science under the Roman Empire. He is the author of Proving History, Bayes' Theorem, and the Quest for the Historical Jesus, Sense and Goodness Without God, not the Impossible Faith, 
why I am not a Christian, not the Bertrand Russell one, but the Richard Carrier one, and Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. He's also a major contributor to the empty tomb, the Christian delusion, and the end of Christianity. He's currently working on his next books on the historicity of Jesus, science education in the early Ro Roman Empire, and the scientist in the early Roman Empire. You can learn more about Dr. Carrier at his website at richardcarrier.info. Now, Dr. Cook. This, th this thing is not high enough for me, so uh, and I prefer not to be um, in one place. So, um, thank you uh, to CFI for for having me at your party, and to all of you for for coming to to listen in. This is a this is a very exciting event. Um, so, Richard Carrier. Uh, is not uh, debating tonight with a Christian apologist. In fact, he's not debating with a Christian at all. He's, so we're not going to be debating tonight about whether the Bible is true or whether Christianity is valid. Those are debates I think that Richard has had elsewhere. Our debate is actually much more subtle tonight. It's whether there was a historical figure named Jesus who was later profoundly mythologized or whether there was a mythological Christ who was later historicized. Given the subtlety of that debate, it goes without saying that Richard and I are going to agree on far more than we disagree about. We agree that there's a tension in the, in the New Testament, a tension between a historical, historicizing narrative and theologizing narratives. We're not unique here. This is um, readers of the New Testament have noticed this for ages, and the only ones who don't notice this tension are those who think that denial is, well, you know how the saying goes. <laughs> so really, this is the core of our disagreement, whether Jesus was historical and then theologized, or theological and then historicized. When I open a class, a historical Jesus class, the first thing I ask my students to do is to consider whether there really actually was a historical Jesus. It's how I believe I have to open that course. And I introduce them to the mythicist position. The reason I do this is because the mythicist position is defensible. They have an argument to make. They're not, all of them, crazy. So, for, for instance, um, Christians have to come to grips with the fact that there are no certain first century records for the life of Jesus. It simply doesn't exist. So, for instance, Philo of Alexandria, a contemporary of Jesus, um, says nothing about Jesus. So, in fact, he's useless to us. Josephus, a Jewish historian towards the end of Jesus' own century, might say something about Jesus. These are, this is the full passage, and the, with lots of Christian-friendly stuff written in red, that he is the Messiah, that he was born, that he was raised again on the third day after his death. Other scholars think that Hi, sorry, that Josephus said something about Jesus, but not with the Christian-friendly stuff, and you end up with kind of an average, mundane description of a historical Jesus. Other Josephus scholars say that Josephus said nothing at all about Jesus. So Josephus' scholarship is, is in, inconclusive, primarily because the material evidence about it is inconclusive. So we get nothing from Josephus, I'm willing to grant. Second century Roman historians do start talking, well, about Christians, but not Jesus. And some Christian apologists take this as evidence for a historical Jesus, but it's not. It's evidence that there was, that there were Christians in the second century, but it's not evidence that there was a historical Jesus. Now, when, with my students, one of my favorite lines to press them on is, what is this or that? When we're looking at some piece of evidence from the New Testament or from early Christian writings, I ask them, what is this thing we're looking at? What is it evidence of? Nothing is ever just evidence. It's always got to be evidence of something. And so, in this instance, I think the, the wholesale failure of non-Christians to talk about Jesus is not evidence that there was no historical Jesus. It's evidence that Jesus didn't matter. It's evidence that he didn't hit Roman radar until a hundred years after his death. 
that it was his followers who hit Roman radar, and only when they became so annoying that Romans had to start writing about them, and that's what they do. So here I think we have evidence that Jesus was an insignificant figure in the Roman Empire. There are no court records even, for example, of his, of his trial and execution. Christian readers also need to come to terms with the fact that their earliest Christian writer, Paul, says almost nothing about the historical Jesus. This is something, again, that Richard and I agree on. The question is, what is this evidence of? The fact is that this becomes a pillar in the mythicist argument that Paul has only interest in the mythological Christ, and that the historical interest, the biographical interest, only comes after Paul. But this position is problematized by a couple of small pieces of data in Paul. The first is that Paul does say a few things about a historical Jesus. That is, he refers to a few things that go back to Jesus. A teaching on marriage and divorce, for example, in 1 Corinthians. He says, he, he makes some proclamation, and, he, and then he says, this isn't from me, this is from Jesus. And this is actually significant, because a few verses later, He's making another proclamation, only here he has to admit, I got nothing from Jesus. This is me. This is me talking now. You have to wonder, if Paul is in the process of inventing a mythological Jesus, then why not just keep inventing sayings that came from Jesus? Why, why distinguish between a saying that came from Jesus and one that he's got nothing on? This is from him. The second piece of evidence is that Paul refers to Jesus as having been born of a woman likely the same kind of language that he would have used of himself. That is, just normal, everyday birth. And then the third piece of item is that he refers to having met a fellow named James, who he identifies as the brother of Jesus. He didn't like him much. James and Paul don't get along. They've got completely different visions for how this new religion that they're in the process, this new movement that they're at the, the ground floor of, they got different views about how this is supposed to be happening. And so James, but Paul at the same time as his letters reveal, is somewhat beholden to James's approval. And you can tell that Paul wishes he didn't need it, but he does. And the reason is because James knew Jesus. That's where his authority comes from. That is, he was his brother. These are fleshly, earthly relationships. My point here is actually not even to suggest that these prove there was a historical Jesus is to suggest that these disprove the claim that Paul has no interest in a historical Jesus. And here is why this is important. Because it challenges the very structure of the mythicist argument, which claims that Paul is interested in a cosmic mythochrist exclusively, and that the historicizing tendency didn't come until later. The Pauline evidence doesn't support this. It's small, but it still requires us to interpret it in one of two ways. Either Paul is... So the question is, where did Paul get this information from? This born of a woman and a teaching on divorce and the stories of the Last Supper. Earthly teachings, earthly uh, parts of Jesus' biography. One of the options is that Paul is the inventor of that material. It's totally possible. Paul made that stuff up. But still, as you see, that changes the model. It suggests that Christo-mythic thinking about Jesus and earthly historical thinking about Jesus were happening at the same time, and oddly, in the same person. And that's not what the mythicist model suggests. But I think, actually, it's even more likely that Paul didn't invent that material. He inherited it. He got it passed on, which means, in fact, that earthly historical thinking about Jesus was happening before Christo-mythical thinking about Jesus. That's, to my mind, what the Pauline evidence suggests. Now, I think that the gospel material also challenges the this. It also challenges the the idea that there's no historical Jesus. But before I do that, I want to. There's a caveat that I want to present, and that is that I don't actually care, one way or another, whether there was a historical Jesus. I've got nothing invested 
in that race. But I also think that Christians shouldn't care either about this debate. The fact is, Christians who are so, um, so troubled by the mythicist criticism don't understand, they don't realize that um, the Christianity that they know and practice is very little based on Jesus. And I'm not claiming that Christianity is a perversion of what Jesus taught, because that would presume that I know what Jesus taught, and I don't claim to have access to that. The point is, Christianity, Christian identity, Christian faith, is so much bigger, more convoluted, more complex than anything Jesus can ever have imagined, or that he's even depicted as teaching. Even if it's all fictional in the Gospels, it's still way bigger than anything we have about Jesus in the Gospels. So, so in a way, as fun as this is, this debate doesn't matter. Though, uh, management is telling me in my earpiece that no, you cannot have your money back. <laughs> There's actually a way, though, on this topic that um, the relish and gusto and aggression with which mythicists often come to this debate sometimes, to my mind, puts them in league with their arch nemeses, Protestant evangelicals. Both groups seem to have this fetishization with origins. Either all of it must go back to Jesus, that's the evangelicals, or none of it can go back to Jesus. And neither position, actually, is tenable. Anyway, that's my caveat. On to the rest of my data. To the Gospels. So, Mark is the first Gospel written which means that the narrativization of Jesus' life starts with Mark. And what we do, what we notice, is that starting with Mark, through Matthew and Luke, who come next, and then John, through the scribes, ending in 325 at Nicaea, Jesus gets better and better and better. He becomes more and more divine. He becomes less and less human. There is a palpable trajectory here. And, the, the, and so Paul, who's got very little but some, very little interest in the historical Jesus, actually fits closer to Mark on this, on this, in, the, in this way. If we consider um, the question of birth, origins, the reader of Mark has no birth narrative. So the reader of Mark has to assume that Jesus had a birth like any other, not worth narrating. Um, now, Matthew and Luke come along and they use Mark and their not happy with the absence of birth narrative. Two chapters in to Matthew and Luke, we already have a more <coughs> theological Jesus, a more divine Jesus, because those two Gospels give us a birth story in which God directly intervenes in the birth of Jesus. We get to John, and there's, there's no birth at all. Jesus wasn't born. Jesus pre-existed the world in the Gospel of John. That's a trajectory that continues on to Nicaea, by 325, Jesus is, is co-eternal and consubstantial with God. There's almost no humanity left in Jesus by Nicaea. And then Paul, as we saw, has Jesus born of a woman, which is why I place him where I do on this graph. Yes, he's mostly interested in a mythological Christ, but there's too much in his Gospels that betrays his own interest and assumption that a historical Jesus sits somehow behind that, mythologi this, that mythologizing process that he's part of. Now, there's a second way that we see this trajectory um, of increasing divinization, and that is with the, the way that Mark is edited by Matthew and Luke. The prevailing theory in New Testament studies is that Mark is written first, and that Matthew and Luke use Mark. They take over his stories and they edit them, and it's in those patterns of editing that we can see a new Jesus emerging. So, some examples for you. Here is the baptism of Jesus, narrated in Mark. Mark, Jesus comes along, he's baptized by John the Baptist, and it's all, uh, it's all very simple. The problem is that in Mark, just before this, we've been told that John the Baptist is conducting a mission of baptism of forgiveness for the repentance of sins. And then Jesus comes along and is baptized into this. That's a bit of a theological problem. Matthew certainly thinks so. Matthew takes over this story and he inserts, invents, 
a conversation between Jesus and John the Baptist in which John objects, Jesus says it's all okay, and John consents. Well, theological problem solved then in Matthew. Very elegantly, too. Especially in contrast to Luke, who is a real mess. Look what Luke does. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized, by who? <laughs> Luke just takes John the Baptist's name out. But that solves the problem. And now, if you're thinking, well, duh, obviously it was John the Baptist. Uh-uh. The immediately preceding verse, Herod imprisons John the Baptist. So who baptized Jesus in the Gospel of Luke? Obviously John the Baptist, but this is Luke's very clumsy way of dealing with the very same theological problem. That, that, so with Matthew and Luke, we have a, we have a Jesus that is more impressive, that is less fallible or problematic. Here's a story um, from Mark in which Jesus attempts to heal a blind man, tries the first time, asks how he did. The blind man says, well, I can see, but I see people, they look like trees walking around. And so Jesus has to take a second attempt to heal him. Now what's interesting here is when I say Matthew and Luke use Mark, they use all of Mark. Either one of them takes a story, either Matthew or Luke or both, but this is the only story that Matthew and Luke both refuse to take from Mark. It's clearly, it's no, clearly not confusing why that's the case. Here is a, a summary story in which Mark is summarizing all of the great things that Jesus has been doing, and Mark tells us that they brought him all who were sick, and he healed many. That's pretty subtle, but still, Matthew has a problem with it, but he switches the quantities. Very simple, but it has clearly the same effect. Matthew's Jesus is bigger, better, and stronger than Mark's Jesus. Here in Mark, when Jesus goes to his hometown and nobody there believes him, he was rendered incapable. He was not able to perform any miracles there because of their lack of faith. Matthew doesn't like that either. Matthew takes out the whole issue of ability and just makes it decision. He did do no miracles there. Once again, Matthew's Jesus is better than Mark's. Here's Mark, here's Jesus um, on his way up to Jerusalem one morning, and he's hungry. He goes to a fig tree, because it's in leaf, looking for some breakfast, and he finds no figs on it. And Mark tells us why. It was not the season for figs, and yet Jesus curses it to death. <laughs> not surprisingly, Matthew has a problem with that. Matthew takes over the whole story verbatim, but he leaves out that one incriminating line, so Matthew's Jesus still has anger management issues, but at least he's not crazy. Mark's Jesus. So those are gospel writers. Gospel writers are authors and creators. The scribes who come in the centuries after are the ones who are just supposed to be copying. They're supposed to be human photocopiers, but they're not. They do some fixing. Here, for example, um, they change a hos, a relative pronoun, to theos. It has the effect of taking Jesus who became manifest in human form, like you could say we all do, to God became manifest, which can only mean Jesus. In Luke's infancy narrative, we're told that his parents, Gones, went to Jerusalem every year for Passover, and then one time Jesus stayed behind and argued with the high priest, and his parents did not know that he was still there. Later, scribes would change his parents, which is a very biological noun, to Mary and Joseph, his guardians. And in the second example, I love this, even less personal, Joseph and the mother. <laughs> so this is, this is the pattern that persuades me that there was a historical Jesus. That Jesus, that, that, that Jesus is too imperfect. To my mind, a mythological Christ would be better at the beginning. If they're going to invent something, well, either that or they were just totally useless at invention. And I, I tend not to think that. I tend to think that, that they were constrained by a historical figure with flaws, and that's, those are somewhat reflected in the Gospel of Mark. Um, 
and that after that um, they were trying to fix those human flaws as best they could right up until Nicaea. So I also think that, that, that we, in Paul we get some human elements in his, in his uh, sayings about Jesus. In the Gospels we get this trajectory. In the end, I think what the evidence shows us is that there was a human figure, Jesus, with a human mission and human characteristics and flaws who, who affected human um, recipients to write about him and that in the process of that writing, he became increasingly mythologized. And if there's one piece of evidence that will persuade you that there was a historical Jesus, surely it's this. Oh, not this. Oh, yeah, drama. And then this. <laughs> Thank you very much. certain specific things uh, that Dr. Brooke said that I will address in rebuttal, uh, but what I'm going to do is present an alternative view of things that won't necessarily address everything that he just said, uh, but we'll get to that later. So I'm going to look at things from a different perspective, but the first order of business when I talk about this is that we want to make sure that we understand that consensus in this field is untrustworthy. Consensus is not valid when it's found in a logically fallacious method. So this is the first thing I want you to realize that when I wrote the book Proving History, the objective of that was to show that a lot of these methodologies are invalid. Now, interestingly, Dr. Crook didn't rely on a lot of these, which is awesome. Uh, so <laughs> that's going to help us a lot uh, as we move forward in this debate. But also ignorance of key facts. I'm going to bring up some things that will challenge uh, the view of things that uh, Dr. Crook presented. But I also want to make a point that I also feel the same way about mythicism. He, he made some comments about mythicism that I actually agree with. Uh, and in fact, I do not endorse, nor will I defend, most mythicist arguments, many of which are amateur and often illogical or factually incorrect or overpassionate, as he pointed out. Uh, I think he's correct about that. But that doesn't mean uh, you throw the whole baby out with the bad one. It might actually be something still there. But importantly, and this is something I'm going to bring up again, presumptions still have to be challenged. I think even secular scholars like Dr. Crook are still uh, operating with, uh, they're looking at the text with presumptions that originated with Christian scholars, and they're still adopted by secular scholars who are falsely assuming that password has been unbiased. I'll give you some examples as we go along. And it doesn't mean that uh, Dr. Crook is a Christian apologist or anything like that. Uh, it just means that he's looking at the text from ways that Christians taught him, uh, or that, that were originated with Christians, that are skewing the way he looks at the evidence. Uh, and if we look at the evidence differently without those Christian goggles, we see things differently. So here's the alternative theory that I'm proposing, and I'm just describing the theory, right? This is an alternative theory of the origins of Christianity. Jesus began as a celestial being, uh, something like an archangel, revealing truths to followers through revelations and hidden messages in Scripture. Christianity began when this being, this Jesus being, revealed that he had tricked the devil by becoming incarnate and being crucified by the devil in the region of the heavens ruled by the devil thereby atoning for all of humanity's sins so the end of the world could begin. And the Christians were teaching this because they saw this promised in the scriptures. Uh, in Daniel 9, Jeremiah 23 and 25, Isaiah 53, Zechariah 3 and 6 in particular, as well as elsewhere. So I'll start with an analogy so you understand what I'm arguing right here. Uh, look at Islam. Muhammad hallucinates, I put that in quotation marks because uh, it could be pretended hallucination or actual hallucination. It's not relevant for my point. Muhammad hallucinates conversations with the angel Gabriel, and the Quran records the spoken teachings of Gabriel. A lot of people assume that that's Muhammad. No, Muhammad is saying that those are the words of Gabriel. Mormonism, we have Joseph Smith, who hallucinates conversations with the angel Moroni and seeing words on magical plates, and the Book of Mormon records what the latter two said. So what I'm saying as an alternative theory is that Jesus was originally a celestial being like Gabriel or Moroni, and taught his followers in the same way. Then he was what we call euhemerized, meaning stories were created, placing him on earth with other historical figures, as was a trend at the time. Then certain Christians later on started believing or selling these stories as true. And this, for two reasons, one, euhemerization was common, it was something that was done to celestial gods often, and also it made it easier to control doctrine, because if you invent traditions, traders who were passing on a tradition, you can trump new revelations. So this is something that was actually 
uh, rhetorically advantageous and is one of the reasons that second one out. So why believe this? Uh, one is because it's typically what happens. Uh, Jewish patriarchs are an example of completely mythicized figures with families who had names, they had fathers, they had siblings, and the whole deal. Uh, but they're completely mythical. Uh, pagan savior gods, we have many examples of this, these celestial savior gods that were given historical stories on Earth, uh, but they never lived on Earth. Modern cardinal cults give us another example. But more importantly, our sequence of evidence corresponds to this. So, uh, the epistles, for example, only speak, and I realize that Dr. Crook has presented some counterexamples to this, which we'll get to, uh, but I contend that these epistles only speak of a pre-existent celestial being and a revealed gospel. They don't talk about any other kind of gospel or being. The gospels come later, and they're wildly deliberately fictional. This is something I'll, I'll bring out later on rebuttal. Yet, all subsequent historicity claims are based on the Gospels, uh, and this is something that Dr. Brook and I agree on. All other evidence from the first 80 years of Christianity's development, other than the Gospels and Acts and the Epistles and Acts, are just an extension of the Gospels, also fictional. All other evidence from the first 80 years of Christianity's development are conveniently not preserved, so there's no other uh, records, no other Christian documents, no Christian arguments between each other, not even in quotation or reputation. And other evidence was forged in its place. In fact, there are dozens of Gospels, Acts, fake epistles, doctored passages, uh, where Christians were creating evidence to promote their particular ideas of Jesus. Now, another trend that Jesus fits into uh, that we have to understand is that Jesus was the Jewish version of a personal savior deity. And these personal savior deities were all the rage at the time. Uh, there are many of them, uh, tons of them, in fact, at the time, all around in the Greco-Roman period. And they have these features in common. They're all savior gods. They all give you personal salvation if you are initiated into their cult. They're all the son of God, occasionally the daughter of God. They all undergo a passion using the exact same Greek word to refer to Jesus' passion. And now this passion sometimes involves actual dying and rising from the dead. Sometimes it does not. It involves some other suffering or struggle. But it's always described in the same terms. They all obtain victory over death through this passion, through this struggle or suffering, which they share with their followers, and that's how you gain salvation through them. And they all have stories about them set in human history on earth, yet none of them ever actually existed. So Jesus would actually be exceptional, even like the lone exception, once you put him into this reference class. And there are also uh, dying and rising gods. So there, this is a trend that also existed that Jesus is being fitted to. Uh, these are three of them. Uh, that we can establish conclusively and predate uh, Christianity. Romulus was a Roman state god. His death and resurrection was celebrated in annual plays. Osiris, Egyptian god, those baptized into his death and resurrection are saved in the afterlife. And Zalmoxis was a Thracian god. His death and resurrection assured his followers of eternal life. So Christianity looks like the Jews wanted themselves one of these, and so they actually created one that's in a Jewish sense of this. Uh, so all the differences between Jesus and these other gods are the deliberate result of making these things acceptably Jewish. Another piece of evidence that's important is Philo of Alexandria, whom Dr. Kirk mentioned, uh, writing in the 20s to 40s AD. He tells us that there was, in fact, a pre-Christian Jewish belief in a celestial being actually named Jesus. Uh, and this is, he interprets this through uh, Zechariah 6, that refers to a Jesus figure, and he says that this Jesus figure is the firstborn son of God, the celestial image of God, quote unquote, God's agent of creation, and God's celestial high priest. He attributes all of these supernatural attributes to this Jesus figure, which is very curious because this is exactly the Jesus figure that, Rome, that Paul talks about in his letters. And I give the verses here where he references all of these attributes, except for Hebrews, which wasn't written by Paul, but nonetheless is a Christian text. So we have here evidence of uh, either a tremendous coincidence that the Jews a uh, separate Jewish theologian came up with a Jesus who had all these attributes, and then the Christians did. Or there was a pre-Christian Jewish theological belief in a celestial Jesus. Now, Philo's celestial Jesus does not do the things that the Christian Jesus did. What the Christians add to this is this, what we see in Philippians 2. The earliest known, the earliest known Christians believed that this pre-existent being, and it talks about it being a pre-existent being, descended, became incarnate, died, and rose again, and then appeared to select people to tell them this. Now, Philippians doesn't reference the appearances, but that is referenced elsewhere. So that's what the Christians added to this. This is what they transformed this, uh, this theological Jesus. 
Now, on the most plausible mythicist theory, the one that I'm presenting today, this incarnation, death, and burial took place in outer space, just below the moon, as we call it. And you wonder, why would we say that? Well, the same was taught of Osiris. This is actually a trend. Public stories put him on Earth in history, but private stories had his death and resurrection occur in outer space, just below the moon, and we have this from Plutarch's account. And we have precedents, similar precedents in the Jewish belief system. For example, Adam, according to some Jewish lore at the time, was believed to have been buried in outer space, so it was actually possible for that to happen, to be killed in outer space to be buried there. It isn't something that necessarily has to occur on Earth. We have some hints of this. The Christians, of course, during the Middle Ages, decided what evidence to preserve. They preserved evidence that they preferred predominantly. Uh, so most of the evidence that we would have of this original sect has disappeared. Notice that 80-year period where the evidence they don't have any. But we have some clues. The ascension of Isaiah is one of them. Uh, late 1st, early 2nd century gospel is what this is, uh, in which the prophet Isaiah receives a vision. Now, the earliest redaction, so far as we can reconstruct, lacks a visit to earth. Jesus doesn't go away to earth. And we can show that there's, there's a gospel that was attacked into there where Jesus does go to earth and gets buried and born to Mary and killed by Pontius Pilate. We can show that that actually wasn't in the original text. There's a variety of pieces of evidence that confirm that. In the original version, which we can see through the actual uh, vision and instruction that is given to Isaiah, Jesus is crucified by Satan in outer space in conjunction with his demons. He's not crucified by Pontius Pilate. So here we have hints of an original gospel, what I'm arguing is the original gospel of Christianity. We have other hints in 2 Peter. Now, 2 Peter is widely recognized, universally recognized among secular scholars as a forgery. Peter didn't write it. And it says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then it immediately forges an eyewitness account of meeting Jesus on earth. And this was done in order to answer otherwise unknown Christians who were claiming such a Jesus was a cleverly devised myth. We know nothing else about these Christians, we just have this one hint, this one attack on them. We don't have any documents from them, we have no other uh, arguments against them. But it would appear that he's talking about Christians who were arguing that the earthly Jesus was a cleverly devised myth that served some purpose and not actually something that people actually met uh, on Earth as this uh, evidence is forged to counteract. So when we look in the epistles of Paul, which is the earliest evidence we have, we ask, how did Jesus communicate? And Dr. Kirk uh, mentioned uh, sayings, teachings of Jesus that Paul would reference at times. Jesus began as a celestial being, revealing truths to followers through revelations and hidden messages in Scripture. Uh, in fact, Paul actually says this in Romans, for example. And it's stated several times in the epistles. No references in the epistles exist to Jesus preaching other than from heaven, or being a preacher, or having a ministry, or choosing or having disciples, or communicating by any means other than revelation and Scripture. And this is completely reversed in the Gospels. It's key to look at this, we have to look at this again and throw away those Christian goggles, those Christian presumptions, and look at this evidence as if we didn't ever hear of Christianity before, what would we conclude? And when we look at this, what we're looking at, it looks like a revealing being, it's the only thing that Paul knows about. In Romans, as I mentioned, 16 verses 25 to 26, the preaching of Jesus Christ is according to revelation of the mystery kept silent for all ages, but now manifested through the scriptures. No reference here to Jesus having ministry, choosing disciples, teaching those disciples, and those, and those disciples handing on teachings. Not there. In Romans 10, Paul talks about the fact that the Jews can't possibly have heard the teachings of Jesus unless the apostles tell them about it. Which means that to Paul, there was no ministry to the Jews. When, when Jesus taught thousands of Jews the gospel, Paul has no knowledge of that. He says the only way you can hear the teachings of Jesus is through the apostles because, as Paul says, the apostles are the ones who got revelations of Jesus. As he says, I am, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And by seeing Jesus our Lord, he does not mean uh, in a historical flesh, he means in revelations. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul speaks of having many revelations from the celestial Jesus, and even relays a two-way conversation he had with them. So this is to give you an idea of the kind of person we're dealing with, the kind of cult and religious context we so according to Paul, scripture and revelation are the only sources of information Paul ever mentions anyone having. The Jesus he knows and refers to and speaks to is always in outer space. And Paul never clearly places Jesus on earth, even when he says he's buried. He doesn't say in a particular place on earth, and we know beings could be buried in the heavens. Or at the same time, Paul does not kind of come to human history in any clear way.
So the evidence is often ambiguous in that sense. Also, Paul says in Galatians, Brothers, the gospel I preached does not come from man. Neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is important because when we look at 1 Corinthians 15, a famous passage that's often cited uh, as supporting the historicity of Jesus, he uses the exact same phrase in the, in the Greek. It's identical. Brothers, the gospel I preach, and then he says, is what I also received, that according to the scriptures, Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that according to the scriptures, he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared to Cephas, meaning Peter, and at last he appeared to me as well, and various others. He also says, I received from the Lord, but I also delivered to you that on the night he was handed over, the Lord took bread and said some things, and so on. Using the same phrase that he usually refers to as in reference to his revelations of Christ. Now note in the 1 Corinthians 15 passage that Jesus is not said to have appeared before his death. There's no reference to him having a ministry, to anyone having seen him before that. He only appears after his death. Now when we look at this without the Christian goggles, we see it differently than if we assume the Gospels are being meant behind us. If we don't assume that, if we just look at these epistles without those Christian goggles, what we're looking at is some sort of guy, some sort of being that was uh, crucified and buried, that was only known through Scripture, and then revealed this uh, from the heavens. And often when he says, according to the Scriptures, the actual Greek phrase often is the way you reference a source. In other words, that's how we know this, is one way to say that one thing that that can mean. And when he says he received from the Lord the vision of the Eucharist, he's talking about Paul himself hallucinating the original, the original so-called Last Supper, or the Eucharist, is the Lord's Supper, as he calls it. He doesn't call it the Last Supper. And thus he's receiving teachings from the dead Jesus, or the resurrected Jesus. He even quotes him, just as he does in 2 Corinthians 12, when he's talking and having that two-way conversation that he relates to. So Paul is actually believes he's having conversations with this celestial Jesus. Uh, Dr. Crook mentions, does Paul mention an earthly family? Uh, brothers of the Lord. Now this is something I'll come up, I'll address hopefully on time in rebuttal. Uh, I contend that when Paul says this, when we remove the Christian presumptions when we look at the text, what Paul means are baptized Christians, because all baptized Christians were called or known as brothers of the Lord. When he says that he's uh, born of the sperm of David, or born of a woman, the actual word he uses means made, manufactured. But in the case of the born of a woman passage, Paul actually explicitly says he's talking about an allegory. These women of, from whom we are born are allegorical, allegorical women, who represent certain types of world, uh, world systems that we are born to or created within. Uh, so in context, in context, Paul is not referring to an actual biological woman. Hopefully we'll have time to discuss that later more. The Gospels, meanwhile, come decades after the fact and are the first we hear of an earthly story for Jesus. The Gospels, I contend, are wildly fictitious in their content and structure. Every single story in them, even the ones Dr. Crook cited from Mark, has discernible allegorical or propagandistic intent. In other words, they are fictions that serve a purpose. The first of these, Mark, looks like an extended meta-parable. In other words, outsiders are told these stories while insiders are told what those stories really mean. And Mark sort of clues you into this in Mark 4. So I contend, as, as other scholars have done, that the Gospels are actually, including the Gospel of Mark, are extended parables about Jesus. Uh, and they represent their parables about the Gospel that serve certain purposes uh, for their author. Now whether there are any exceptions to that, of course, is where one could go on debating. Uh, if you want to pursue that, you can pursue these books I've just laid on the screen here. Uh, to follow that up. There's no other evidence. Everything else is either not independent, uh, they just echo the Gospels or what Christians said the Gospels say, or is fabricated. In other words, the infancy Gospels, for example, and various other things. Lots of fabricated evidence. And I think this is one of, one of the cases where Dr. Crook and I agree. So I'll end with an analogy to give you an idea of what I'm proposing that actually explains the evidence differently than Dr. Crook has proposed. Now look at the Roswell analogy, the Roswell UFO case. I'm sure many of you being CFI people have heard of this. Some of you in attendance might not have, but you can Google it uh, if you haven't heard of it before. Now what really happened? Uh, a guy found some sticks and tinfoil in the desert. That's actually what actually happened. What was said to have happened? It was debris from an alien spacecraft. What was said to have happened within just 30 years of that? 
An entire flying saucer was recovered, complete with alien bodies that were autopsied by the government. <laughs> now, this is what I'm proposing. The tinfoil in the desert would be analogous to revelations of the archangel named Jesus, right? And the flying saucer and alien bodies would be analogous to the historical Jesus of Galilee. Imagine if we only had the stories written by the Roswell believers from 30 years later and information derived from them and nothing else. Imagine if that had happened. We would not know about the tinfoil. All we would have are multiple witnesses and sources recording a flying saucer recovery and in body autopsy, neither of which existed. So the key for us is to try and look at those texts and see if we can find clues to whether that is actually what happened or if something else happened. That's my argument. All right. So my response. I opened by saying that um, that the reason there are Jesus mythicists around is because they, they have a case, there's a case to be made for it. I'm going to be a little bit more playful in my response and say that the reason there are so few of them is because their arguments are crazy. I'm being playful. The, um, I see this in a couple of areas. The first is in partially, um, either partially uh, referenced evidence or uh, evidence with very strained interpretations. So Paul, we start here with Paul because Paul is central to the mythicist position about Jesus, that Paul knew only a cosmic deity and the historicization came later. As I've said though, um, Paul, though Paul is mostly interested, he does have some, some, there is, there are historicizing trajectories that Paul, I think, has inherited. Um, and so, for example, as you saw here with it, there's already an issue over how do you interpret brother. Um, and uh, and uh, Richard's solution is that brother uh, means a baptized member. Now, Richard, of course, knows that Christians are well known for you, early Christians are well known for using uh, fictive kinship uh, terminology. This is terminology that's universal in any voluntary association. Um, but the fact is that just because there is uh, kinship, just because a lot of people are using fictive kinship language, it doesn't mean that every use of kinship language is fictive. And here I find a parallel, I, I, I found an earlier parallel between the, the, the mythicist argument and Protestant evangelicals with the fetishization of origins. Here I find an interesting parallel with Catholics. Catholics are well known for arguing for the perpetual virginity of Mary, of course their own invention. They use that to force a reading onto the New Testament that is totally counterintuitive, that brothers of Jesus, brothers and sisters of Jesus are cousins and half-brothers and, you know, um, 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 step-brothers and sisters, so that Jesus really was an only child um, and Mary was ever virgin. Both groups, I think, Catholics and mythicists, are imposing, are presupposing, if you, if you come at this text by presupposing that there was no mythical, Je that there was no historical Jesus, then James the brother of Jesus must mean something else. But I think the most straightforward reading, Paul's not even talking about Jesus here. He's talking about his biography. And as I said, his biography involves several run-ins with James, who he doesn't like, and who he's beholden to because of James's relationship with Jesus. So when Paul refers to James the brother of Jesus, he wishes that James wasn't the brother of Jesus because of the tension that's between them. The second example is with euhemerism, which you've heard referred to already. Euhemerism is the claim that actually when Euhemeros first said that, that all religion, all the gods, come from, were originally just people who were so revered and adored that their followers, mythology, that they, they deified them. Um, oddly, I'm not sure I understand how Richard uses euhemerism against Christianity or against this position, because that's actually the point I'm making, that Jesus was a historical figure who was euhemerized, that is turned into a god later. But again, not every mythological figure is evidence of euhemerization. And here I turn to the, the genre of the bios. A bios is a fiction that is told about a historical person. So if we think of Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars, he talks about Augustus. Augustus was a historical figure, but the bios is full of mythologizing tendencies. Suetonius tells us 
that, that, uh, that Augustus was the son of God, the son of the god Apollo, that his mother was impregnated by a snake while sleeping in the temple of Apollo, that Apollo, that, that uh, Augustus' birth was, was, was uh, known by signs around the world, by non-Romans as well, and that Augustus, as a young boy, was trying to sleep at the summer cottage and the frogs were making too much noise, so Augustus silenced them with a word, and to this day the frogs still don't croak there, Suetonius says. Well, with so many parallels here with the Gospels, that the Gospels are obviously, they have their closest genre analogy in the bios, which is a narrative about a historical figure, but that is so full of mythologizing features. So what I contend is that, that, um, that the bios is not considered anywhere in Richard's presentation, to me says more about the presuppositions that he's coming at this argument, and not about the data, which shows more parallels with the bios than with anything else. The third example is, I find too many instances of what I would call eisegesis in Richard's reading of the evidence. Exegesis is proper scholarship. Exegesis is where you, you read a text and you draw the meaning out of the text. Eisegesis is where you're reading meaning into it. One of the passages that uh, Richard referred to is the, the, the bit from Philo. The claim, when I read the claim, that Philo talks about a pre-Christian Jesus who, who, is, who is a deity with all of this language, I was extremely surprised. So I go to Philo, and this is what I find. Philo is talking about a biblical passage, it's Zechariah 6, that Richard alluded to. And there is a Joshua named in this passage. Now Philo was, a famous, um, was famous for his allegorization. So in this work, Confusion of Tongues, he, he translates six, Zechariah 6, 12, and he says, Behold a man whose name is the East. He's already translating it in an allegorical way. And then in this passage, he mentions that this person is incorporeal. He is without body and in no way different in form from God. Then later in this work, he refers to the high priest as a possible son of God and firstborn word. Later, he says that the high priest is divine word and firstborn son. There's all these parallels between early Christian language of Jesus and this Philonic language of the high priest, a, a figure, a, an office that Philo reveres immensely. But it is from this data that Richard claims that Philo gives us evidence of a Jesus who was pre-Christian, divine, celestial being. Because Joshua is the equivalent of Jesus, the most common name in, in antiquity, so to claim that this Philo evidence gives us is, is evidence of a pre-Christian Jesus who is pre who is pre-existent and divine, I think is, would be a little bit like me suggesting that Shakespeare anticipated that this debate would happen tonight with his Richard plays. Richard is a common name. The time difference is simply not conceivable. That that this is this is the reading that we get. Also, when I go to the evidence on Zalmoxis. Now, if you're like me, and you probably are not, and I probably shouldn't tell you this, but when I first come across this name, I initially thought that Zalmoxis was one of those drugs that certain couples use when they're having trouble, but no. <laughs> Zalmoxis was a religion, a very small religion, that, was, that existed on the edges of the Roman Empire. Now, I'm not going to, I can't talk about whether or not this small region produced a narrative that could spread throughout the Mediterranean in such a way as to influence Christians to, in, to invent a similar narrative. But I can say that to read Herodotus's narrative in this way is extremely strained. I can say that the evidence about Zalmoxis is anything except, uh, except self-evident, that, 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 that there are many sources that talk about Zalmoxis, and it's not clear that Herodotus's is the only one that we should be following, which is kind of the feeling I get from Richard's presentation. There are other narratives, in other words, that suggest that Zalmoxis was a Pythagorean philosopher before he was divinized. So, in closing,
think I'm at my close for my rebuttal. One of the things that comes up a lot in Richard's presentation is the amount of parallel, the number of parallels that there are between Christian narrative and rhetoric and claims and Jewish and Greco-Roman mystery religions and all that. And that's all true, absolutely true. But it's that in itself is not evidence that there was no historical Jesus. What it's evidence of is that's, that those are the ways, those are the influences that Christians had as they started to narrativize and mythologize this historical figure. That's my response. All right, so I've got to rebut 30 minutes and 10 minutes, so I'm going to go fast. Uh, the first order of business, Dr. Crook is right. We agree on far more than we disagree, and I agree with most of his opening statement and even much of his uh, rebel as well. But I think we're, in some cases, talking past each other. The main challenge that he says is there's a gospel trajectory. Uh, Dr. Crook claims that Jesus starts out as an ordinary historical man in Mark and becomes mythical over time. And Pauline attested to attestation, Dr. Crook claims Paul says Jesus had a mother and brothers, therefore he was historical. Dr. Crook is wrong that only by the time we get to John is Jesus there at the start of creation. That view is already in Paul decades before Mark wrote his gospel, as I'll show in a moment. So the trajectory Dr. Crook describes isn't there. Mark is mythologizing a celestial being into an earthly man in the same way historical biographies, Bidos, as he calls it, historicized other celestial beings like Osiris, Romulus, even Zeus, and Uranus. Evidence of a preceding mark, I give some citations up here. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11, Paul cites this hymn. Many scholars agree that this is a hymn that predates Paul, which has Jesus as a pre existent being who descended and became incarnate. We have several other verses, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, in which Paul mentions Jesus being the agent of creation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul says Christ was present in the time of Moses. Uh, and there are other verses, Romans 8, 29 and Romans 8, 3, that imply. Uh, that Paul understood Jesus to be a pre-existent being that was sent to, sent down uh, to do this. The mythologizing that ensued after Mark was historicizing, making Jesus a more grandiose earthly figure, just as Dr. Crook uh, eloquently and humorously documented, I love that, with even firmer claims to eyewitness evidence of his earthly existence. Just compare Matthew, Luke, and John on the resurrection against Mark. Mark, meanwhile, is creating literary fiction for allegorical purposes. He is using Jesus as a model for missionaries to teach the gospel and to teach each other how to be missionaries in the public. For example, his empty tomb account is rife with scriptural allusions about the meaning of the resurrection and the gospel that don't depend on the story being true. And I contend this is true for every single passage in Mark. Dr. Turk's examples are only of later Gospels not liking the earlier Gospels and changing them. They are not evidence that they had any knowledge of a historical Jesus or that Mark did. Uh, for example, the baptism by John, even in Mark, I contend is fiction. I give the citation there if you want to see the full argument. Mark's story is a literary model for Christian baptism. Christian baptism meant being cleansed of sin and then being adopted as God's son. So that's exactly what Mark creates a story having Jesus do. His story also co-opts the authority of John by having him declare Jesus his successor and superior. So this is a fiction that serves a particular purpose in Mark's story. Only when Jesus was fully historicized and the story then read literally did this create a problem that later authors had to fix that Dr. Crick done. None of their changes reflect any knowledge of the of Jesus. Again, with earthly parents born or being made of a woman, in context, Paul actually says the women he's talking about in, in chapter 4 are allegories. He actually says that. He explains that we are born of the same woman, the slave girl, he, as he talks about it, being the corrupt world order, uh, the corrupt world subject to the Torah law. But thanks to Jesus, we will be reborn of another woman, the free woman, the, meaning the celestial world. So when he's talking about Jesus being made of a woman under the law, he's talking about this allegorical system that he's setting up. Galatians 4, you have to read the whole thing in context. And it's the same thing in Romans 1 3, as well as Galatians 1 4 4. Paul uses genomenos from genomai, meaning to happen, become, be made. Now, in other cases, you can use this to mean born, but Paul never uses that word in the human birth himself, despite using it hundreds of times, typically to mean being or becoming. His preferred word for being born is genom. And his several examples, even in Galatians 4, notably really not in reference to Galatians 4. In 1 Corinthians 15.45, Paul says Adam was made, using the same word. 
Now, Adam was made. Now, Adam wasn't born, so that is not a reference to being born, but to being constructed directly by God. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians 15, 37, Paul uses the same word of our future resurrection body, which is also not born, but directly manufactured by God. So, Romans 1, 3 and Galatians 4, 4 could be the same implication. When we take those Christian goggles off and don't have any presumptions about what he means, you can mean that at least as likely as anything else, if not more so. This brothers of the Lord thing, uh, let me present to you some evidence that uh, hasn't been presented uh, in this debate yet. Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8, 29, because all baptized Christians are brothers of the Lord. By adoption, they all become sons of God, and therefore, by definition, are brothers of the Lord. Many passages of Paul attest to this. So in 1 Corinthians 9 and Galatians 1, Paul is one of the only cases where he uses the full phrase, brothers of the Lord. Instead of just brothers, normally he just says brothers, when speaking of non-apostolic Christians and apostles in the same sense. There's only two places where he does that, and in those exact two places are where he uses the full phrase so that he's absolutely clear. 1 Corinthians 9, when Paul means that even if non-apostolic Christians on church business have a right to church support for a wife, so should Paul who outranked them. That's the argument going on there. Paul never otherwise refers to Jesus having biological brothers and never feels any need to distinguish between the Lord's biological and cultic brothers. If there were biological brothers and they were any different than the cultic brothers, he would need to make it that point, but he doesn't, he doesn't seem to realize that there's any need to make that distinction. It's unknown to him. So we get to James the Apostle. In Galatians 1, uh, this is the famous passage where Paul says, uh, I did not go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me until after three years I went to visit Kephas, Peter, but another of the apostles I uh, saw by none except James the Lord's brother. That's how it's usually translated. But L. Paul Trudy, in Novum Testamentum uh, in 1975, pointed out that this would certainly be an odd way for Paul to say that he met only two apostles, Peter and James. It would be a much more straightforward way is the way he just said it. The Greek, in fact, actually says, other than the apostles, I saw only James, meaning this James was not an apostle. Christian presumption has overlooked this. This is something that Christians have been looking at this text and interpreting this text for hundreds of years. And it's been inherited by secular scholars. They're not going back to the Greek and looking at it without those Christian problems. Ordinarily, to say you saw no other apostle, you would write some other Greek phrase. But Paul instead chose the unusual, for Paul, unprecedented construction, heteron, to an apostle Paul. And in this context, the word heteron plus the genitive in this fashion usually means other than, rather than another of. So what he's talking about is other than the apostles, I met James, who was also a Christian, a brother of the Lord. He's not referring, he doesn't make any reference to this being a biological relationship. He shows no uh, worry over, over this fact uh, that it's the biological relationship that's the problem. His only problem with James is that he disagreed on what relations they were receiving from Jesus. And also we can point out that there's no extra biblical evidence uh, until we get to the second century. Even the New Testament does not ever mention James being the brother of Jesus being an apostle. Uh, and this is something that people often uh, don't realize, but if you look, even in the book of Acts, it doesn't happen. So, assumptions underlie every other rebuttal, I think. Um, to point out a few things, uh, I do not claim Philo says that the pre-Christian Jesus was equal to God, for example, but that he was a created being of God, God's support, through which, uh, his agent, through which he created. Uh, so, when I talk about that pre-existent claim, I'm not talking about what John says, the Gospel of John, I'm talking about what Paul says, which is that the same thing Philo says, which is this, there was this other subordinate being that God created at the, at the creation who lived in heaven at the same with Jesus. Some other point, important points to bring up. Um, the logical point, uh, just because some historical persons are mythologized, I fully agree, doesn't entail that all mythical persons were ever historical. Uh, we have to look at the evidence to determine that, so we can't determine it by just looking at examples of the contrary. For example, the Bios by Plutarch of Romulus. This is a mythical person. He never existed historically. So in order to tell the difference, we actually have to look at other evidence. And in the case, for example, of Alexander the Great, so on, we have tons of evidence that confirm that he's historical. Whereas we don't have that in the case of Jesus. In the case of Jesus. Um, let's see what else uh, is brought up. Let's talk about uh, the passages in our Dr. Crook mentioned a uh, lack of a virgin birth in Mark. Mark had no use for a birth narrative for his missionary allegory. He's building stories for missionaries to use. A birth narrative serves no function in that. Only historicists had needed it. Only people who weren't trying to do allegories, but were actually 
uh, trying to present people with a historical Jesus needed a birth him. He mentions uh, Mark uh, 31 or Mark 3:21, but the entirety of Mark 3 is a series of responses to typical things Christian missionaries faced, including uh, the idea of not being able to heal people in your own hometown. So, for example, having Jesus not being able to do that, and then having uh, statements about explaining why he wasn't able to do it that vindicate him, is a model for missionaries to do the same thing. So missionaries now have a story that they can tell, well, even Jesus couldn't heal the unfaithful. This is the purpose of the fiction. Mark is using Jesus as a model for Christian missionaries to use, who were healers and exorcists. Note that Paul never mentions Jesus being a healer or an exorcist. That is never mentioned in the epistles of Paul. There's no concept of that in there. Uh, some other passages he mentions, uh, the scribes fighting over certain things. He mentioned different ones that I have up on the screen. But the fact that later scribes are fighting over the text is not relevant. What we want to look at is what was in Paul, and then what were the purposes of Paul from Mark's writing. Mark is downplaying the gospel of the celestial son. In order to, it was preached for decades before him, as we saw Paul in order to create an allegorical fiction. And then other things like one Timothy, Luke, and so on, uh, these are forgeries and fictions, and you can't base it as those you want. So, thank you. Okay, so, um, I didn't mean to claim that the redaction that I showed, the editing of Matthew, of Matthew and Luke against Mark, that editing proved there was a historical Jesus, what I was thinking it, it illustrates is that um, this, the, the idea that there was a pre-existent Christ followed by a historicized Jesus is far more complex than that two that by that bipartite model actually suggests. Because what what we what we actually see is that Mark created a historical and a historicizing narrative that was then rejected by the rest of Christianity. They rejected Mark's humanizing mood. Um, and that's, that's way more complicated. And like I said, um, it's unclear to me why, um, well, as I said, it doesn't, that's not supported by the evidence that, that there's simply Mark created the historicizing trajectory and that, and the rest of Christianity fell into line. The claim here that, that, uh, that born of a woman is an allegory, he's right that it doesn't say ganapo, and I've never noticed that. Um, but as he says, ginomai can mean to, uh, to be born, but the claim that it's an allegory is incomprehensible to me. The word allegory occurs 20 verses later and refers to a whole different story. So no, Paul is not saying that Jesus having been born of a woman, he meant allegorically. From the slide that was about how Jesus communicated, um, Paul only mentions Revelation as how Jesus communicated for a reason, because he thinks this is how Jesus chose him and because his main competition is James, who did know Jesus. So Paul is underplaying. Paul never mentions, as, as, as Richard says, Paul never mentions miracles or any of the controversy stories or any of the teachings of Jesus or, or any mission of Jesus. Paul only mentions post-death because that was Paul's experience of him. So Paul, had an halluc Paul has a, a hallucination of Jesus, and that is Paul's authorizing moment. His main competition is James, the brother of Jesus, and they are completely at odds. So the reason Paul says nothing about an earthly mission for Jesus is because it would undermine his, his own authority, especially in competition with James. Uh, Romans 8.29 does not say brothers of the Lord, it just says brothers. In other words, there is adoption happening into this movement. This is fictive kinship movement. But the phrase, brothers of the Lord, doesn't occur at 829. I couldn't check up all the other ones because things were flying by very fast. But, but I went to that, and it doesn't say. And this is a point I made earlier, that too often when I go to look at the evidence, I don't actually find it there. Um, the, the Philippians 2 doesn't talk about pre-existence. So some scholars might here and there think so or might make the argument. But when I go to the text, I don't see pre-existence in Philippians 2. Uh, James being an apostle wasn't, oh, so there was another point where, 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 where he rebutted with some Greek about, about how there's some debate, it's unclear in Galatians 2 whether James was an apostle, but James being an apostle wasn't the dispute, it was James being a brother, 
And uh, Mark, he, 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 writes, he, he speaks very um, uh, strongly about Mark being written, having been written for missionary purposes, but this is totally news to me. And I don't know how one would establish that we know why Mark was written. And yet so much of his rebuttal and so much of his imagination of what Mark was is really founded upon that fact, and I have no idea where he's getting it from. That's all I've got here for, for my final rebuttal. Philippians 2. Christ Jesus, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be seized, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, incidentally the same word that we've been talking about. And then being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient, even unto death, yes, the death of the cross. This is a pre-existent name. It's pretty clear in that sense. Uh, interestingly, Bart Ehrman had actually indicates me on this. It's his latest book. Actually agrees with me on that point that Paul is talking about a pre-existent being. We have other examples. The fact that uh, Paul says Christ was present in the time of Moses. Clearly, we're talking about a pre-existent being. I mentioned several other examples. Uh, I do want to correct one thing. Uh, he looked in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 for the brothers of the Lord thing. Uh, that might have been just a confusion of uh, things going by too quickly. Obviously, I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, where the brothers of the Lord is, does appear, and it only appears twice. Uh, so I don't want you to think that I'm referring to things that aren't in the text. Uh, actually, I've researched this pretty thoroughly, so I know uh, where things are. Uh, the idea of um, mentioning a historical Jesus, mentioning a ministry of Jesus would be a problem for Paul, is a self-defeating argument. Because if, it, if that were the case, it would be used against him constantly, and he would have to respond to it. Paul never faces this argument. He never has to rebut this argument. So the fact that Paul never has to rebut the fact that these guys were handpicked by Jesus and lived for years with him, whereas Paul just saw a vision of him one time, Paul never has to rebut that argument. They're never using that argument against him. That argument is never being used against him by any of his congregations who are challenging him. It doesn't occur. So that's the important sense here, where we're looking at something that's missing from the text that we would expect. So that's actually evidence against his city. Uh, to correct a few other things, I don't claim Zalnox's cult influenced Christianity. Uh, but it is an example of a common trend. In other words, there are lots of these examples. Christianity is just one instance of it. It was a trend of fashion as the source of influence. Although I'll point out that Galatia was actually uh, invaded and colonized by Celts from Thrace hundreds of years before, after Zalmoxis, and before Paul wrote to the Galatians. So uh, the possibility of influence there is more realistic than you might think. All right. Um, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Okay. Uh, I'll just point out uh, what I pointed out before, that when we look at uh, the text of Philo, what we're talking about is a being that has the exact same attributes that Paul references. So again, look at all of the things that this Jesus in Philo has. He's the firstborn son of God, the same thing Paul says. He's the celestial image of God, the same thing Paul says. He's, the God's, he's God's agent of creation. In other words, he's, he's the agent through which God created. Paul says that as well. And the idea of him being the celestial high priest is also fundamental to the early Christian gospel. So again, what we're looking at here is a common trend. There's either a tremendous coincidence, or there's some sort of core tradition that they're both inheriting and treating differently. Philo, of course, is unaware of the way the Christians treated this evidence. And finally, I'll just reiterate the point that when Paul gives us the gospel, again, the ministry is absent from the gospel itself. He's reciting the gospel, the fundamental gospel. All the, the only source he mentions for Christ dying for our sins and being buried are the scriptures. And being raised on the third day, the scriptures. It's his only source. He didn't say there were witnesses. He didn't say anybody saw this. He doesn't mention the ministry of Christ as being fundamental to the gospel. He doesn't talk about him preaching. He only says that he appeared to people, and that's the beginning of the gospel, as he attests here, and he only appeared to people after his death. So this is, again, when we take away the Christian goggles and look at the evidence, it's looking very differently uh, than the Christian presumption of it. And of course, obviously, I can't uh, answer everything here that you might have. We'll have some questions, we'll take care of that in a little bit. Uh, but obviously, there's a zillion more threads to follow on this, so I highly recommend you explore it more thoroughly.
but I do recommend uh, not trusting amateur writers unless you hear an expert uh, author tell you to trust them or to try to look at them. Uh, what you want to look for is not websites that talk about how many parallels there are between Jesus and Horus. That's generally crap. Um, what you want to look for are uh, good scholarly arguments that are being published uh, through peer review. And right now, uh, my next book coming out is the one to look at. It's going to be due to share. Uh, so uh, keep your eye out for that, and hopefully that will keep this debate going, uh, because we haven't gotten anywhere near, I think, to resolving it. I think there's a lot more conversation we can continue to have, uh, and, and that's good. I want that to happen. So this, this is the kind of debate that we'll see more of in the future. So thank you. Thanks very much to Dr. Carey and, and Dr. Cook. Um, now we'll take some questions that we've collected. So um, I'll pose the questions, and um, some of them are are designated for one or the other, and some are designated for both. And uh, so I'll start with uh, the first one. Um, and, and also, if you have uh, remaining questions, we're, we're collecting a few more, so uh, um, you still have a chance if you haven't had had your opportunity yet. So this question is for both of you. Given that the biblical account of the resurrection contradicts Jew Jewish burial law, i.e. that females were not allowed to handle a dead male body, how can they be considered trustworthy? So, do you want to start, Dr. Cook? They're not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would I care to expand? No. No, no, really, I don't. That's, he's, he's right. We agree on this. Uh, that's fiction. Uh, I do think there, some of that, we do have to question whether we can simply assume that certain rituals and, and laws were in place uh, governing what women could or couldn't do uh, in that respect. Nevertheless, it's, I think, irrelevant. Like, it says it's, it's a fictional story. Oh, and it, I'll give Dr. Crook uh, one prop. That it's a fictional story whether Jesus existed or not. Uh, and I think that's something Dr. Trick would agree, that, that even if Jesus existed, it's still a fiction story. And so we can't really, from that fact alone, determine whether Jesus was existent or not. I mean, perhaps I should add that, that um, uh, the resurrection narratives on, um, that Christians are producing are there to legitimize um, their, their veneration of this figure. Um, and uh, and they're... They, they're not exactly like, but they're clearly in some ways related to other ancient literary trends that, that give exceptional people specialized, special death experiences, just like the virgin births give their heroes special birth and start of life experiences. Uh, so the, the, the problems with the resurrection narratives aren't that women were handling the dead body. It's that it's a resurrection narrative. <laughs> there's, there's actually a we used to have a, 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 a friend from India who said that there was a there was one there's a one word that they used that translated to when you're carrying a corpse on your back, what does the weight of the pubic hairs matter? And I think about that line. All one, that's all one word. Okay, this this question is um, for Dr. Carrier. I see the motivation for subsequent writers to mythologize a historical figure. However, I don't understand what would motivate a writer to create fictional evidence for the appearance of a mythological or celestial being on Earth. Why do that? And why set the encounters in the relatively recent past, i.e. 80 to 150 years earlier? Well, to answer the second question first, that's because that's when the, the religion itself originated, and more importantly, it's the cultural context in which Christianity at the time wanted to have a conversation. So the role of the Jews and the Romans and all of that in that context is the, is the society or a model of or a, you know, a version of the society that Christian missionaries are dealing with. And so that's why they had to pick that particular society to put it in. But also I think because that's when they thought the, the cult originated, uh, and when the first revelations of Jesus occurred. And so that was the natural place to put it. Notably... Uh, Christians outside the Roman Empire, in the east, in, in the Babylon region, uh, 
uh, placed the resurre- or placed the living of Jesus, the historical Jesus, a hundred years earlier. Uh, we have this mentioned in Epiphanius. It's also the only version of Christianity that the Talmud of Jews, who are writing the Babylonian Talmud, had ever heard of. They'd never heard of the, the, the execution by Pilate. They'd only heard of the Jesus who was executed under the, the um, Emperor Jana, or King Janias a uh, hundred years earlier. So there were Christians putting it in different places and different times for different reasons. Now we don't have any of the texts uh, from this other Christian sect outside the Roman Empire, so we don't know what their thinking was. In the case of Mark, uh, what we can tell is when we look at all of the, the, the scenes that we have going on, uh, he has Jesus go in from scene to scene to scene and do things that are the things that Christian missionaries are doing and meeting the challenges that the Christian missionaries are meeting, and then giving Jesus pithy sayings, refuting them or, or explaining what's going on, uh, and making Jesus look really smart. And so the missionaries could then not only use this as a model for themselves to teach each other, but they could also use it as models uh, for teaching the gospel when uh, explaining these things to people. And you can look at a lot of the literary structure in art. What he's doing is creating actual allegories and actual parallels and systems that are models to explain what the gospel meant. Uh, to give you an example, the reason I suspect that he has uh, the women being the ones who go to the empty tomb, and being the first to discover the empty tomb, uh, is this fundamental concept of the gospel, that the least shall be first. Uh, it's often said, that why, why wouldn't the men be the ones who would be the first ones? Yeah, that comes up later, where they have the men go and, and check the tomb. That's when you have the historicists who actually care about this story being true. Uh, and that, that you get in Luke, for example. Uh, but when Mark's writing, he's exemplifying this idea that the least shall be first, uh, by having the least in society be the first to discover uh, the, and hear about the resurrection of Jesus. Um, there are other aspects of this, as we can see throughout the Gospel of Mark, where these things I didn't have time to go in. I had several slides, but I didn't have time uh, to cover them. So, um, did you want to say anything more to that? Okay, uh, the next question. The Roman Pontius Pilate was reputed to be a meticulous record keeper. Was there any known reference to Jesus in the Roman records? And uh, do you want to... Not that I know of, and um, I'm also not even aware of the of the, the reputation that Pilate was a meticulous record keeper. <laughs> I'm curious. See, so that's that's an example of a thing where I immediately go, "Where did you hear that?" <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not saying that it's untrue that there isn't a passage somewhere that says that. I'm not aware. Uh, I haven't found a passage like that. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but. I do often hear these things, like Pilate was a meticulous record keeper. Um, I've heard that before, uh, but I, I don't know what it's based on. So, um, the, the simple point is that even if he were, um, if he were any more a meticulous record keeper than Romans generally, uh, most of those records were destroyed. Um, we have lots of those kinds of records from Egypt, for example, because uh, in the sand they don't rot, um, whereas in Judea most of those records were destroyed over time. Uh, so there were probably, almost certainly, tons of records, but we, we have none, actually, from uh, Judea. Well, very few. Uh, very, very, when I say very few, I mean very few. Compared to Egypt, where we have a lot, and even the ones in Egypt are just a tiny fraction of the records that were. So even in Egypt, where we have tons of, tens of thousands of these records that have survived, that's just like 1% of the records that were. So even in Egypt, most records were destroyed. Uh, so this is what we can expect. So we can't really make an argument from silence from the absence of uh, a pilot record uh, of Jesus. You can't argue that Jesus didn't exist from that. Okay, this question um, is for both. What do you make of the evidence of the oral nature of the society of the ancient Mediterranean? As in, the Gospels were written down later, but the stories themselves were earlier. Well... The problem is that kind of um, that kind of thinking works when you have people you can talk to who knew these stories that they were transmitting orally. The fact that the ancient Mediterranean was an oral society doesn't mean that the Gospels are the result of oral tradition or oral transmission. Um, if there was no historical Jesus, then the Gospels are an invention of nothing, and that happens. It does happen. I don't think that's what happened in, the, in, in this case, but it does happen. That whole, that, that entirely new narratives are created out of whole cloth with no basis in historical reality. Um, and so, so orality doesn't really play into explaining, explaining anything. I, I completely agree with everything he just said. Um, and, and I would also point out that, that it, this is just to harm you when, you face, when you're faced with this by Christian apologists. 
Um, if, if the oral traditions were so reliably uh, preserved, why do all the Gospels so radically disagree? Um, why did they do all the things that Dr. Kirk mentions? Clearly, the later Gospel authors were felt free to doctor the evidence and change it any way they wanted to. And if that's the case, uh, then it would have been the case, and it would have been even easier to do for the oral tradents before Mark for decades. Uh, so you just think of how many of those inventions and changes that the Gospel underwent before Mark even wrote. Uh, this is something I talk about in Proving History, when you actually realize this, that the gospel was being preached for an entire, what was then an entire lifetime, across three continents. Um, before Mark even put pen to paper, you have to understand that tremendous amounts of changes to the gospel, all the editing that you would expect to have occurred, occurred before Mark even wrote. So, uh, the orality argument is deeply problematic, even beyond uh, what he was saying, and I agree with what he was saying about it as well. I do want to say one thing, though, Richard, because I don't think that... Um, the creativity, like the data that you're presenting, to my mind, tells us that we were going to have a great deal of difficulty getting back to a historical Jesus through the Gospels because of the because of the rampant creativity. Um, but that is not data about the historical Jesus. It's data about whether we can get get to Jesus through the Gospels. Oh yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm very glad you brought that up because that's another important methodological point that I want to make sure that people walk away with is that I am, I'm not arguing here that the fact that the Gospels are fictionalized in the ways that I argue, that that proves that Jesus didn't exist. All I'm doing is showing that that evidence doesn't count. Uh, and, and so you, you, so you can't use the Gospels to argue that Jesus did exist. It does not mean that Jesus didn't exist. In fact, I find the Gospels count for very little in the final calculation. Uh, they do count for some, but only when you can be very rigorous in the way that you apply your principles. And I, I do this in the next book. But generally, just the fact that fictions, just the fact that you can't recover Jesus from the Gospels doesn't mean Jesus didn't exist. And I give this example in my next book that's coming out in June, which is uh, Haile Selassie, who's uh, Rastafari, uh, the, the supposed savior of Rastafarian faith. The Rastafarians teach that he was the second coming of Christ, and he denied this to his death. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Gospels arose, completely fictionalized Gospels about him, uh, that if those were all we had, we would have no idea what was true about Rastafari at all. It's just the fact that we happen to have tons of external records about us, Haile Selassie, that we can reconstruct what the truth was and what's not. We can't do that for Jesus. So it's entirely possible that Jesus is like Haile Selassie. He was a real historical person. And then the stories got so wildly mythologized afterwards that we just have no idea what the truth was. And yet there was still a historical person behind it. So that's, poss that's a possibility, and we do need to consider that hypothesis seriously. Okay, do you know of other similar debates on other key religious leaders? The main focus is on Jesus. Why aren't the other leaders equally challenged? Um, what, what, I, what I think we're talking about in Bayesian terms would be, is, is, is that our reference class, uh, founders of religions? Uh, the problem is it's a bit circular because you're assuming that the founder of Christianity is Jesus and not Kephos, for example. Uh, so it's like saying that Gabriel is the founder of Islam rather than Muhammad. Uh, so is that, if that's your presumption from the start, you're already answering your own question. That's a circular argument. Um, so when we're talking about founders of religions, who do we mean? Is Moroni the founder of Mormonism, or is Joseph Smith the founder of Mormonism? Uh, when we talk about Christianity as we know it today, it really traces back to Paul. I mean, obviously Christianity originated before Paul, but most of what we mean by Christianity today is an offshoot of what Paul did to Christianity. Uh, the, the original Christianity was very loyally Jewish. You had to still get, you still had to get circumcised. You still had to follow Jewish uh, Torah laws and dietary laws and so on. The original Jewish sect of Christianity. Uh, petered out. Uh, but you had this transformed sect that Paul created, and that's the sect that exploded and became successful for various reasons. Um, so, uh, the point being, um, what was the original question here? Remind me. So I get back to my... Yes, other leaders. Uh, so when you're trying to figure out other leaders, who, who do you mean? Do you mean the Moronis, or do you mean the Joseph Smiths? And then you realize that you have to kind of answer that question first before you can ask the question. Which is, uh, Kind of annoying, but anyway. <laughs> Do you think that without the existence of Jesus, Christianity's core beliefs and values are discounted? Yikes. 
Kind of. <laughs> I mean, as I said in, in my talk, the um, Christianity, um, I think of the analogy like a, a plant can't exist without a seed, but the plant in no way resembles the seed. So Christianity has got to go back to Jesus in some way, whether even, I'm like totally fictionalized, even a mythological Jesus, the Christianity uh, uh, still goes back to. Um, Christianity is then built upon the writings of, of the New Testament. Whether they're real or not, accurate or not, his, of historical figure or mythologized figure. So, so in a way, maybe the answer I think is no. The, the, um, the, the, the teachings and benefits and values of, of, of Christianity they don't really. They ought not to rely on those having those teachings haven't been delivered by an actual flesh and blood person. They're there in a Bible that was canonized and then accepted as a, as a scriptural authority by a world religion. That should be enough. Yeah, that's actually that, that, that's a good point. I, that was one of the, the uh, pieces of advice I was going to give to Christians in the future. That you can do that. You can do what Thomas Brody and, and who's, who's a lawyer, who doesn't who believes Jesus didn't exist and yet remains a loyal Catholic. That um, his view is that Jesus, that the myths that the, the gospel authors created about Jesus contain deep truths upon which you can base a faith, uh, and it's it's he's taking the allegory seriously. At, that's the point of it, which is probably how Mark intended it, right? It's like Mark didn't care whether Jesus existed. The point is that what he's claiming about uh, the gospel, using Jesus as his puppet to do this, Mark believed was true, or certainly wanted people to believe was true, and it's theoretically possible it's true. Although the fact that it was created by people who were not philosophers, scientists, or members of the modern world makes it unlikely. Um, the same point goes to uh, the Jesus myth theory, because note that, that when I'm talking about the origins of Christianity, it's entirely possible that I'm totally right that Jesus began as a celestial being and that myths were created about him afterwards, and at the same time Jesus actually existed. In other words, the celestial Jesus thing might actually be real. In other words, the celestial Jesus who was giving revelations to Paul might have actually been a celestial Jesus who actually lived in heaven and actually revealed himself to Paul. It's entirely possible. It's just that Dr. Crook and I uh, you know, uh, are operating from the assumption that those things don't exist in general, so we don't even debate that point. Uh, neither would most people in this audience. Uh, but Christians could go there. They could go back to this and say, oh yes, actually, thank you for discovering the actual original Christian faith. Now we can move on and, and have a real Christianity based on the original celestial Jesus and not this fake earthly Jesus. Uh, it's entirely possible. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, then you would get to metaphysical arguments as to why that's not plausible. Jesus, man or myth, how can we debate it when the only evidence we have is interpretations of the Bible written in another language in different versions? Damn. <laughs> um, okay, well, the, version, the versions are irrelevant because, um, because we've got thousands of Greek manuscripts um, that, uh, that allow us to, to establish the text of the New Testament as it existed in the fourth, by the 4th century, um, for certain. Um, we have fragments of the text that exist before the 4th century. We just don't have whole New Testaments of the Greek before the 4th century. Um, so the, the question of versions is irrelevant. Um, what was the first part? Oh, so yes, um, it's a major problem that, that um, if the historical Jesus lived, he did not speak Greek. Um, he spoke Aramaic. And so at some point between Jesus teaching and saying things in Aramaic and those things, if we're going to, if there was a historical Jesus and if the Gospels are in, you know, in some way, shape, or form reliant on oral tradition, which I'm willing to allow to a certain extent, um, then in that process of oral transmission, translation also had to happen. And it's just another one of the barriers that exists to getting back at historical Jesus material. So again, all that, all the, that though does is problematize our ability to know what Jesus actually said in his actual mission. It, 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 the, the question of language inversions doesn't address the question of whether there was a historical Jesus. Okay, so aside from the Bible, and that's spelled B-U-Y-B-U-L-L, -L, aside from the Bible writings, are there legitimate historical records such as court records of trials, executions, etc.? 
Uh, this goes back to what I was mentioning before. Um, the answer is yes, we have some scattered examples of those from Egypt again. Uh, but I don't think, when you talk about trials, for example, uh, trial affidavits and uh, uh, judgments and so forth, I don't think we have any examples from the Roman period in Palestine. I could be wrong, because I haven't extensively checked. Um, but if, even if there are, they're like extraordinarily rare, uh, unlike in Egypt. Uh, and and that's, you can make the same point about any other kind of document. Yeah. Was the question about um, execution trial records of Jesus, or just in general? Yeah, that's good. I assume in general. But... So I don't. I don't know in general. I can say absolutely not um, with Jesus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And we have one last question. Can you explain a bit more about the debate among Josephus scholars on whether Josephus wrote about Jesus? Is the issue to do with translation, conflicting documents? Why is it unclear what Josephus wrote? Okay. Um, it's unclear because Josephus was a traitor to the Jewish people during the, the war with Rome. Um, he became a client of two Roman emperors. Under their patronage, he wrote his histories of the Jewish people, history of the Jewish war, and Jews did not keep his te his writings because he was a traitor. Christians were the one who were the ones who kept his writings. Um, and so, when when people wonder whether the Christian, when they say, um, when they wonder whether G whether um, whether the Jesus material in Josephus was added, it's because Christians were the only ones transmitting, perpetuating the, the, the writings of Josephus. So they would have a vested interest in having the the key Jewish historian talk about their uh, their Messiah. The reason why 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 it's inconclusive is because there are there are manuscripts in other languages, say a Syriac of Josephus. That, that, that actually quite resemble the second passage I showed where all the red letters disappeared and we were left with a, with a mundane description of a Jewish teacher who was crucified by Pilate um, and whose followers still exist to this day. It's, it's, there's nothing Christian friendly in that except there's a Jewish historian attesting to this figure and then later to James being the brother of this figure. Um, so the fact that there are manuscripts out there that have... Josephus talking about Christians, but without Christian-friendly terminology, is what makes this so complicated. It's why Josephus scholars can't agree on whether Josephus said a lot, something, or nothing. Uh, yeah, the, the Arabic text that he's talking about has actually now been proved to be a derivation of the Syriac text of Eusebius, so that we can actually trace it back to the original text that is the non- altered text. So that, in fact, that alteration occurred after the fact. Uh, so it does not represent an earlier version of Josephus. So that's kind of killed that, that argument. Uh, if you want to know uh, the scholarship, so you can go check it out. Uh, that's a, a, a woman who's a, one of the experts. I unfortunately can't remember her name off the top of my head. Uh, Wheelie, I think, but uh, I might be saying that wrong. I hope not. Uh, my apologies uh, to her if I did. Uh, she's written on this extensively, and, and I cite that evidence in uh, the Journal of Early Christian Studies where I extensively discuss the evidence in, um, in Josephus about this. So if you want to explore that, look at all the scholarship, because I also cite all the other scholarship that's uh, important to read on this, pro and con. Uh, if you want to see the evidence as to why we would think that this is Dr. Passages and that, in fact, Josephus never mentioned Jesus, uh, that paper, which is in the Journal of Early Christian Studies, I've reproduced uh, in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, so, and, and along with other of my peer-reviewed journal articles, so that those are normally really hard to get a hold of because... They're behind paywalls. You have to pay $25, $35 to look at a single article. Uh, whereas if you, you hit their home, right, just put it all in there so you can get it all in one place. But that's the place to look if you want to see that. Because then you can follow up the bibliographies and check out the scholarship designs. Okay, well, thanks to Dr. Crook and Dr. Carrier for a fascinating discussion. Thanks to all of you for coming. And a special thanks to all the volunteers who made this event possible.
I see through it all. I used to believe you, but now I don't need to. I finally see through, I see through it all. And since you can't see through the shit that they feed you, then you're gonna be you. I see through it all. I used to believe you, but now I don't need to. I finally see through, I see through it all. And since you can't see through the shit that they feed you, then you're gonna be you.